as we are going to be looking at the cross tonight uh, in detail. Um, but before we do that, we're going to review Mark 1 through 5. Uh, that was kind of your, your homework assignment, was to be reading the Gospel of Mark. Um, and can somebody tell me what a gospel is? What a, what a gospel is. Not what the gospel is, but what a gospel is. Good news. All right, so that's the gospel, and sometimes a gospel can be good news, but we're talking about four specific books, right, that, that fall under this category of gospel. So what is a gospel? Mark's a gospel. Okay. So what's, what, now let me rephrase my question. What is uh, a gospel about? When we're, when we're talking about the Gospel of John, or the Gospel of Luke, or the Gospel of Matthew, or the Gospel of Mark, what is it specifically talking about and kind of passing on to us? Yeah, the, right, the, the, the testimony about Christ and his life and his teaching, his ministry, his death, and his resurrection. So that is what a gospel is. And so we have four gospels in our New Testament, uh, and... Luke and Mark are not written by apostles. All the others, John and Matthew, are written by one of the twelve. Uh, but Mark and Luke are not. And so when we're looking at these Gospels that are not written by an apostle, we have to say, well, how do they know what they know? How can they be authoritative in telling us this testimony about Jesus? And so we know from Luke that he wrote under the authority of Paul, that he was writing basically the in one sense, maybe the gospel even according to Paul, but he was friends and companions with Paul, and he was a historian. And so he, he delved into that, um, the testimonies of those who were eyewitnesses, and he gave an account in his gospel, and it's really kind of two parts. This is Luke and Acts. Um, Mark, on the other hand, was a companion with Paul on some of the missionary journeys, and then split with Paul on some other missionary journeys, but eventually made up with Paul. But Mark was a companion of a different apostle. Does anyone remember from last week? Yeah, Peter. So Peter and Mark are, are good friends. Um, and Mark gives Peter's testimony of what happened with Jesus, what Jesus said, what Jesus did. Uh, and as you guys started to go through those first five chapters, uh, it's kind of cool how we start to see things, even maybe from Peter's perspective. Um, Peter includes himself in the story in different places uh, in a unique way that kind of tells us that, oh, this is, this is coming from his perspective and what he sees. Um, and Peter, as he relates it to Mark, is giving us a very punchy narrative. Things are happening. It's, it's going fast. It's going quick. We have that word immediately over and over and over again, uh, jumping through the narrative. So let's spend maybe the next 15, 20 minutes uh, and just kind of talk through what you guys read, address any questions, any cool observations you guys made um, through those first five chapters? So maybe starting in chapter one, uh, what, what was stuff that stood out to you as you were reading? Jesus was yeah, so Jesus was baptized. And so what does the, the baptism of Jesus tell us? Uh, even so put so... Right at the beginning of Mark, what is, what is the baptism of Jesus telling us in the Gospel of Mark? Who baptizes Jesus? John, right? And so, actually, at the beginning of, of the Gospel there, we have this, um, this prophecy, or a, a collection of prophecies, but kind of under the banner of Isaiah the prophet, they're talking about this messenger who is a, a forerunner or a proclaimer of the one to come. And that's John. Right? And so John, he, he steps into that prophetic role from the Old Testament. He's the one announcing the Messiah. He has his ministry. Um, he's described in pretty vivid details of what he eats, what he dresses like, where he's at. Um, and he baptizes Jesus. And so in one way you could say this is like the baton handoff from the Old Testament to the New Testament. The, the prophetic ministry has, has ended because the one that they were prophesying about is here. And Jesus is on the scene. And so the baptism of Jesus is that handoff. What else does the baptism of Jesus show us and tell us? What happens after Jesus is baptized? 
Yeah, well, so immediately in the context, right, he's called something, right? The voice from heaven speaks and says, you are what? Yeah, my son, right, my beloved son, in whom I'm well pleased. And so keep that in mind, because we're going to come back to that at the end tonight in Mark uh, 15. But that voice basically commends Jesus, announces to everyone that this is the Son of God, and Jesus immediately starts doing what? Right through the end of chapter 1. What does he start doing? Preaching, teaching, doing his ministry. So, yeah, he, he's, he's proclaiming, he's teaching, and this is basically the, the launch point. The baptism is the launch point of Jesus' ministry, uh, and really is going to be the launch point for the rest of the book of Mark. So what else in chapter 1 uh, stood out? Any questions? Mm-hmm. John appeared and baptizing in the wilderness and proclaim a baptism of repentance for sin, for forgiveness of sin. So, in Old Testament, forgiveness, forgiveness of sins only through the blood of Christ. Still yet, Jesus didn't come, mm-hmm. and Jesus didn't even sin, but he was baptized. Yes. So, I'm yeah, just so, a little Yeah, so why was Jesus baptized if he didn't need to be forgiven of sins? Yeah. Yeah, so I think at least two things are happening. One, he's identifying with the people, right? Yeah, he, he's showing that I, I am going to come, and in some way in this, in this relationship, there's going to be something to do with your sins and me. Um, and so he's identifying with the people. Um, but he also is I, not, he's not coming under the authority of John in that significant way. Um, in fact, that's why John's so clear as to, that is to one who's coming, who has a greater authority, who is um, higher than me, has a, has a mightier than eyes, he says in verse 7. And so as, as Jesus comes to John, this is John, in one sense, saying, this is that guy. Um, he's not saying, I'm baptizing him for his sins, but in one sense, he's like, here he is. He's right here. Um, I don't know if Rick has any other thoughts there. Sounds great. Cool. You, know, it, you remind me, though, like in John's Gospel, for you know, swapping notes, of course, he says, John sees Jesus walking, behold, the Lamb of God mm-hmm. who takes away the sin of the world. Yeah. So there's a, there is this association with what's going on of whoever Jesus is, what his role is, and, mm-hmm. and he's going to deal with sin. Yeah. But is that, at that time, they, they, they didn't have a temple, but they, don't, they didn't have a temple, but at that time, so they didn't really able to uh, be forgiven their sins. They, so they did have the they temple. Still, they still have yeah. a uh, sacrifice mm-hmm. of the lamb. Mm-hmm. And then he say he's baptizing, and then it's forgiveness of repentance, but forgiveness of sin. Yeah, so John, when John's saying that, John is saying, prepare your hearts, get ready, like repent of your sin, turn from your idols, turn from the things that have basically, in one sense, what we're going to see with all the scribes and Pharisees, have drawn you away from true worship of God. And prepare yourself, basically, in humility to receive this one who's coming. Uh, so it's more like a preparation. Uh, and, and as we see even uh, in the followers of Jesus, um, like even Andrew uh, is, is likely a follower of, I think we know he's a follower of John uh, the Baptist, before even he's a follower of Jesus. So there's people that are following John that are saying, like, we're pointing towards Jesus, and they see Jesus, and they start following Jesus. And so that's what John's role was. Right. Quite, I saw a hand back there. Uh, yeah. When did the Jews start actually baptizing? Yes. When did that start? Yeah, so that's a good question. So we don't have any historical information beyond John the Baptist here that definitively says that there was baptisms happening until like well after uh, the temple was destroyed in 70 AD and all that. So there's, like, there's traditions that maybe there was baptisms happening, but we don't have any hard evidence. And so it really does seem like this is a unique... Uh, a unique emphasis that's starting with John the Baptist. Yeah, and so and so this baptism is different than that. Uh, in a, like the, the only thing that we can compare it to is like when we have the the command to Naaman, right, to go bathe in the river. Um, but that wasn't something that happened that we have any record of happening. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, like in, in the Old Testament prophets, one of the themes that we see there is that salvation comes out of the wilderness in this way. Um, and this this uh, 
Mark is very deliberately pulling a lot of threads from the Old Testament to say who this Jesus is, is and what he's going to do. And so he's really trying to point to Isaiah, which in this class we're not studying Isaiah, but, right, but Isaiah, specifically the suffering servant, the one who's going to come, who's going to suffer and die in the place of others. Um, and so Mark already is trying to tip his hand to say, that's who I'm going to be talking about. Um, and as we see, even as, let's move on through the text, right? In the wilderness temptation, Jesus goes out to the wilderness too. Uh, so we think wilderness, we think of like woods and trees and all that kind of stuff. Like this is a desolate place. And what really marked it is that this is a place devoid of people. Uh, and so this is where Jesus goes uh, in his temptation uh, by Satan. And he succeeds. And so we're not given a lot of details on that temptation. All we know is that Jesus goes, he's tempted, and that the angels minister to him. And then he starts, mini- starts his ministry. Um, but for us, as, as the readers, we're going like, okay, Jesus is ready. Like, he, he proclaimed who he was. Uh, John, or God proclaimed who he was. John baptized him. The baton was handed off. He passed his temptation test. Here we go. And then Mark just takes us on that roller coaster ride. Um, look at verses 14 and 15. In one way, I guess we could say this is like the, the big overall theme of what uh, Jesus does in his ministry. Uh, and maybe even just kind of the, the overall theme of, of what he's going to do in Mark. Uh, so after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. So he's saying, I'm here. The king is here. Like, it's time. Like, repent of your sins, turn from them, believe in the good news about me. <laughs> believe in me. Um, and that's his message, really, through the whole book of Mark. All right, any other questions in chapter 1? And there's no, no worries if, if not. All right, Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so he's really more emphasizing the posture of your heart, that you are, you are turning, that you're identifying yourself as a sinner, turning from it, and, and saying, I, I need forgiveness. And that's, that's all that it is. It's not being, uh, it's not receiving that forgiveness in one sense, like you, it's a transaction. So it's more about being, basically readying yourself for the Messiah to come. And Jesus says, believe in me. Uh, I can forgive your sins. Uh, if we jump to, to chapter 2, right, this is the controversy that, that happens with the, the Pharisees. Because when the man comes down through the ceiling in the middle of everybody who needs to be healed, instead of Jesus saying, get up, you're healed, he says, I forgive your sins. Uh, and, as in, like, the, the, Mark is trying to set up that there is somebody that can forgive sins. His name is Jesus, and that's what he's going to come to do. And that's the whole point, um, even as we get to like Mark 10.45. Um, and, and the cross later on tonight. Okay, so as we move through chapter 1 into chapter 2, Jesus starts his ministry. He's, he's teaching with authority. It's causing amazement. He's uh, healing. He's, he's casting out demons. All of this is, is showing his authority. Um, we get to chapter 2, and really from chapter 2 into chapter 3, it's all about these controversies with the religious leaders, with the scribes and the Pharisees. Uh, what, what's something that characterizes these controversies? Or what's a theme that, that you might have seen in there? I guess, why, why is there a controversy? Shouldn't the scribes and Pharisees be excited that Jesus is there, excited that he's teaching these things, excited that he's doing uh, all the things that he's doing? He broke the law, the God's commandment. Is this four? Okay. Sabbath. Okay. And he healed people on Sabbath. And that's why. Right. And he didn't have his, he didn't, um, have his disciples fasting either. Um Right. Right. And so, so Mark is trying to set up for us 
is to show us that these Pharisees, they have set up these traditions and it, it, they value these traditions and they, even traditions that were meant to be good things, they valued them so much that they became harmful things and bad things. They would even hurt other people in order to maintain their tradition. Uh, and, and Jesus comes to say, like, well, that's not the point. Like, the, the, the point of these laws even that God has given you for the Sabbath, for example, is to, not to do harm, but to do good. Um, and so Jesus deliberately, right, almost starts to set himself into opposition from the, the Pharisees by saying, I'm, I can forgive sins, I am God, by saying, God yeah, right, exactly. Um, Yeah, that's where it, yeah, it comes to a head in chapter 3. Uh, like even when he calls Levi, right, the tax collector, he, he's calling somebody who is so looked down upon in, in Jewish society. I mean, he, this guy's a traitor. Like, and, and there's no way we can say it otherwise. This guy's a traitor. He's deliberately stealing from his own people. He's, he's hurting his own people. He's willing to associate himself with the oppressors. And Jesus calls him and says, hey, be one of my disciples. And the, the Pharisees, they go, how can you do that? How can you associate with somebody who's so sinful? Um, and, and then Jesus, right, he, he goes and he eats with the tax collectors, with the sinners. And they're like, how can you do that? Uh, and, and it comes down to that uh, point that he says there in verse uh, 17 of chapter 2. Uh, Those who are well have no need of a physician. Pharisees, they think they're great. They, they think that they don't have any problems. They, they don't think they have a righteousness problem. Uh, and Jesus, he knows that. And so this is why he says it this way. They have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, right, those who see their condition, kind of going back to that baptism and, and that, those who are repentant and, and humbled and looking for, for salvation, looking for forgiveness, those are the ones that I came for, right? I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. And so this is kind of the, the theme then. And as we get into the, the idea of fasting, and he has those different examples of uh, being with the bridegroom or this unshrunk cloth or the new wineskins. What he's saying is, I'm going to break your traditions. And you have to choose whether you're going to go with Jesus, go with me, and, and, and this way of life that I'm offering and the way of forgiveness that I, that I bring, or you can stay with the traditions that are a millstone around your neck that will bring you to death. And he's saying, you, you have to choose. Uh, and as it gets to, to chapter 3, uh, look at verse chapter, uh, chapter 3, verse 5. Right? They had created this test to, to see almost if, if Jesus would break the Sabbath law by healing on Sabbath. In the synagogue, no less. And so he, he knows this. He, he, he walks willingly into that situation. Uh, he asks them, right, is it lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do harm, to save life or to kill, right? And they know the answer, but they're silent. And so he looks at them with, with anger and grieved at their hardness of heart and said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretches out his hand. It's restored, right? Verse 5. And then from that point on, verse 6, the Pharisees went out and immediately held counsel with the Herodians against him how to destroy him. So, so from this point onwards in Mark, so as we read through Mark for the next few weeks, uh, from this point onwards, the Pharisees and the scribes, they have a, they're making a plan to kill Jesus. Uh, they, they made a decision on whether or not they're going to go with their traditions or they're going to go with the Messiah. Two enemies are being united. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, they're willing to, to be bedfellows with the, with the enemy in order to get rid of their bigger perceived enemy. All right, so any questions from chapter 2, chapter 3? Yeah. Why is knowing Jesus the most important thing that is a call for not letting demons speak in uh, uh, 134? Yeah, yeah. So he, he doesn't permit them to speak. Uh, there's, there's probably at least two reasons that he does this. Uh, one, demons are of lies. They are of Satan. They are of the kingdom of, of, of the world, the kingdom of Satan, opposed to God. 
So Jesus doesn't want to let them ever say anything right to, to everybody else. He doesn't want them to be the ones informing the, the people around about who he is and his identity. If Jesus is going to tell his identity to anyone, he's going to tell him himself. Uh, he's not going to have basically the, the enemy be the ones telling everybody his identity. Um, but that keys us into a, to another thing that you guys probably picked up a few times in these chapters. And it's this secrecy that Jesus has about his identity. Uh, and so why is Jesus trying to keep who he is a secret? Right? That seems really kind of counterintuitive. Like if you came to be the Savior, came to tell everyone what you could do and who you are, why would you tell people to not say about what you've done and who you are? Um, what do you guys think? Mm-hmm. So that you know, he's gonna rebuild. Uh, he will be rebuilt uh, who he is when the time comes and God has appointed day. Yeah, you know that's that's a very that's a big part of it is that he knows the timing. He knows the plan. He has a destination in mind, right? He knows that it's going to end in Jerusalem, and so part of it is that he doesn't. Right? I mean, there's only so much that we can say, certainly. But part of it is that he, he doesn't want the situation to escalate beyond uh, what, he, what is needed for that moment and that time. Right. For example, the lame man that Peter and John healed after the resurrection, mm-hmm. Jesus passed that guy a bunch in the temple all that time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't that guy's time yet. It yeah. Was what Jesus knew ahead of time. Yeah. I mean, there's that saying, I just use that illustration. Maybe yeah. Well, we see, yeah, what we see when Jesus does miracles, what's the general response of the people around? Following. It, Looking for yeah, there's amazement and there's crowds, right? And, and how are the crowds described? How did you guys maybe pick it up on this when you were reading? How are the crowds described in these first five chapters of Mark? Pressing, Pressing in, yeah, oppressive, like they're, they're in the doors, they're in the windows. Um, what's actually pretty interesting is that uh, the crowds start to have this negative uh, connotation in, in Mark. Uh, it, there's true followers, the true disciples, the true family of God, and then there's the crowd. And Jesus says, you, you can't be in the crowd, you have to be in my family. Uh, and so the crowd, they actually start to get in the way of, of people that are trying to get to Jesus. And so Jesus, he gets away from them too. So he, he gets out, he gets in a boat in the water, he teaches from the boat. He goes across the lake of the Sea of Galilee to get away from them. Uh, jump real quick, because now that we're on that topic, jump real quick to chapter 5. Um, so the, the middle of chapter 5, verse 19 and, and 20. So Jesus, he had been teaching, he had been teaching in parables on the other side of the lake near Capernaum. He gets in a boat, Sea of Galilee, they go across probably through the night. There's a massive storm, right? This is the, the, the calming of the storm, the, the seasoned fishermen. Like we were so quick to diss the disciples. I mean, these, there's four guys there that spent their whole life fishing. If they're scared, then that means it's the real deal. Uh, they're probably not going to just freak out over a little wind. But they, they get scared, right? And, and Jesus, he, he, calm, he rebukes the storm, and then he rebukes them for saying, have you still no faith? They get to this land on the other side of the Sea of Galilee in the land of Gerasenes in verse 1 there of chapter 5. And the, the demoniac confronts him, and, and Jesus casts out the legion of demons into the pigs, and all that happens. But that's not what I'm trying to point to. Look at verse 19. Um, that healed demoniac who had faith, who truly trusted in Jesus wanted to go with Jesus. He wanted to be a disciple of Jesus. And Jesus says, no, right? Go home to your friends and don't tell them anything. No, he doesn't say that, right? In fact, Jesus has a different message for this guy than he's had for all these other people. He says, go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. All right, so that's a very different message to this guy. Uh, why is that? Well, at least one reason, this guy's in a Gentile region. He, he's not with the Jews. He's not with the hardened hearts that Jesus had been teaching to. Uh, he's in a different region. And as he goes away, right, as, as he went away, 
verse 20, he began to proclaim the Decapolis, which is a region, these cities, um, how much Jesus had done for him, and everyone marveled. And then Jesus gets on a boat, and he goes back to the other side for a few chapters. But then he's going to come back, and we're going to see this in our reading this week. Uh, he comes back to that region, and he begins to preach, and everybody knows who he is and what he's doing. Why? Well, because somebody went around and told them what Jesus, who Jesus was and what Jesus had been doing. And so God, Jesus is going to use people in different ways to accomplish his mission for his timing. So when he needs a crowd there, he's going to have people get a crowd there. But when he needs to not have a crowd there, he's going to tell them um, to, to be quiet, to be silent. All right, any other questions? Chapter 3. Question, what's the last time the Holy Spirit? Ah, uh, Yes. Yes. Well, Rick can help me too, because he's here. Uh, really, at least if, if I'm understanding it correctly, it's really just the, the, the sin of, of deliberate, blatant unbelief and the, and the, when such great truth has been presented to you and, and revealed to you in such a merciful, gracious way, and you reject that, then there's, like, there's nothing else that can be given to you to, to open your eyes to show you the truth. And so by blaspheming, by rejecting that, you've basically sealed your fate in one sense. Um, yeah, it, it's, a, it's a past, I think it's like one of the most looked up Bible verses in all the New Testament. Um, but it, yeah, it, it's, it's really more just it's the ultimate rejection of unbelief. And, and for Jesus, right, he, he's right before them and he's telling them about himself and they're rejecting him to his face. And if they're not going to hear him and believe him there, then they never will. That's kind of the way I would take it. I don't know. Yeah, I agree. I, practically, I mean, I think why it's looked up so much, uh, people might be afraid that I do that. Mm -hmm. That I commit blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. There's no hope for me. Um, the, the, if you're concerned about that, there's hope for you. Yeah. Because that's the Lord working in your heart. Yeah. Um, you know, making you open to these truths that you might repent. Mm -hmm. um, so as we're preaching the gospel, or maybe even about our own soul, we, we might not ever know about when someone has or hasn't committed this. Mm -hmm. uh, but we preach the gospel to everybody. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you want to receive the gospel, Christ won't reject you. Right. And, and, and again, just to emphasize that, blasphemy of the Holy Spirit it isn't some kind of uttering certain words. It's not like a magic formula. It mm -hmm. is like a heart of unbelief mm -hmm. that is settled on that. And if you're open to hearing, then you, ha you obviously haven't committed this yet. Right. Yeah, and, and yeah, as he gets on later in the gospel, right, he's going to say, those who have ears to hear, right, and those who have ears to hear, if you're hearing and you're prompted and you're concerned, right, and, and anyone, right, like that's a, that's a sign that there's something working in your heart that is sensitive to who, who God is and what God has to say. Um, God doesn't dangle the carrot of Right. 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 Yeah, and actually in that passage there, it's sandwiched around like all of the stuff that's happening in Jesus' life, right? He, he's, his, his siblings had, his, and his mother had come to go get him because they thought he was crazy, that he lost it. Um, he has this whole interaction with the scribes who are like, you're being possessed by, by Satan. And, and he's like, whoa, like, first of all... I, that would be really dumb of Satan, right? Satan, Satan's not that dumb. It's basically what Jesus says. Uh, it's like Satan would actually be more thoughtful and planning than that. Um, a house that's divided against itself can't stand. Uh, and he's trying to show, like, look, I, I am I'm presenting all of these things before you to show my divinity, to show my authority. You're denying it. Like you, you've basically, you're in this hardened state of unbelief. And then he gets to where his, his sisters and his brothers and his mom show up. And kind of it's, it's a similar thing that happens all over again. Um, where they're like, hey, your family's here. And he's like, what are you talking about? I only have one family. And this family is the family of God. It's those that actually truly believe in God. And the way you know that they truly believe in God is how? Verse 35. It's whoever does the will of God. He is my brother, my sister, my mother. And so Jesus, as, as we go through the Gospel of Mark then, he starts to really lay down uh, these, these clear markers of what it is to be a follower 
of Jesus and what it's to be not a follower of Jesus. Uh, and so it, Rick said this last week. We're going to hear it again today. Like Mark, as he's teaching this gospel, is trying to show us who Jesus is. He's not some superhero. He is super authoritative, super powerful, but he's coming to die. And so Mark's trying to show you that this is a suffering servant who's going to die. So that's what he's trying to show, one thing. The second thing he's trying to show you is what it actually means to be a follower of Jesus. That it's not just saying, I'm there. It's not just being in the crowd. It's not following all these traditions. No, it, it, it's having faith and having um, a true heart that truly bears fruit, that truly wants to follow God. Um, and so that's illustrated, of course, in chapter 4 with all those parables. And just like a real brief summary, right? There's, there's four soils. One of them, outright rejection, unbelief. Like that's the, the one where the, soil, the seed just bounces off, gets eaten up by the birds. That's unbelief. Um, in one sense, you could say that's the same unbelief that we'd already seen earlier by the scribes and Pharisees. Uh, but then there's three other soils that all from the beginning look like they're good. They're all producing something. Um, the, the second soil, right, is the one with the rocky ground. And we think of rocky ground, like we think of like, I mean, I grew up in Powhatan. There was just rocks everywhere. Like every time you mow the grass, there was rocks in the yard. You had to like dig out, whatever. That's what we think of rocky ground. What they had as rocky ground was really like a layer of limestone with a thin layer of dirt on top of it. And so for them, it looked good on top. You throw the seed on it. It looks great. Uh, but there's only this much dirt. And so when the sun comes up, it's a little greenhouse effect. The plant grows great, but then it actually gets too hot and it gets scorched, and it dies. Uh, and what, what did Jesus say that shows? What, what kind of heart is that showing? It's a heart that's been what? Yeah, it's the one, look at verse uh, 16 of chapter 4. It's the one who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with joy. Right, they're growing. It looks great. But they have no root. They can't get down because the rock is in the way. And so they endure for a while. Then when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, right, on account of the gospel message, that's why they're receiving this persecution, uh, immediately they fall away. Right? They're, they're the ones that are burned up. Right? The, the, the third soil is the one with the thorns, uh, the weeds. Uh, again, this is probably a plant, a weed that had been chopped off right at the ground, had all of its roots still under the ground, which is like a little stump. You threw the seed in there. The plant you, that you're trying to grow grows up great. But then all of a sudden, from the stump of the weed, a bigger plant goes up, shades it out, chokes it out. It can't grow and produce fruit. Right? It's a green, green leafy plant. It's growing, but it's not producing fruit. Uh, and that's when we get to the fourth one, uh, which is true faith, a true heart, true belief, is the, the heart that receives the word, believes it, trusts it, and grows true fruit. Right? And, and it's a life that, that's demonstrating it. And so Jesus, right, he has to explain this to his disciples because his disciples, they don't get it. Um, why does Jesus use parables to teach with anyways? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So parables. Right, a parable is is a a story or a or a even like a small proverb in one sense that has a heavenly principle behind it. So it's using earthly means, earthly tools, earthly stories to explain something that has a heavenly principle. And so when when Jesus is using parables to teach, he's he's trying to show people heavenly truths, spiritual truths. Now the crowd, right? They they are, in one sense, the, the example of unbelief. Right? They don't understand these parables. Um, and so the reason why Jesus is even teaching is so that he can teach those who have ears to hear, right? As he says in in he says it multiple times in this chapter. Right? Those who have ears to hear, let them hear. Um, so the parables are for those that have ears to hear that can actually listen. And 
the other purpose of a parable is to hide, in one sense, mask the truth from those who are hardened in unbelief. In one sense, God's not going to cater to unbelief. He's going to, to present the truth to those who need it, and he's going to, to keep it basically in this parable form for those that are rejecting it and hardened to it. And so at the end of chapter 4, then, we have those, those other parables, and they're just talking about the kingdom growing, uh, the purpose of, of the spreading the gospel, how the kingdom grows in mysterious ways and God's ways, how it's going to grow bigger than you could ever expect in the parable of the mustard seed. Uh, and then we get to, to chapter, or Jesus calming the storm in, in chapter 5, uh, which is kind of where we're going to end here tonight. Um, any questions from chapter 4 or chapter 5? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that's exactly what it is. It's describing that principle of for those that have ears of faith, as I teach you these, these parables, you're going to know more and grow more and hear and have more faith. For those who are hardened in unbelief, as I teach these parables, and one says they're going to keep making you hard, even harder and even more hard in unbelief. They're going to keep you basically in that sense, uh, in that state. Um, and Jesus, I mean, from here on out, is only going to teach publicly in parables. Uh, so in that sense, like he, he, he has been confronted with hardened unbelief of his own people. And so this is, in one sense, his response to that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it could be, definitely. They're going to have to stand and give an account for that. Mm-hmm. So I was too convinced that. Yeah. Because of understanding the sovereign election. Yeah. I mean, he, he's going to say later on that, I mean, it's better for some of these really pagan places, Tyre and Sidon, than for you guys. Because you guys have basically been exposed to this, you've heard this and know this, and it's going to be basically, that's going to be the thing hanging over your head. Um, but for those that, that actually heard and, and listened, um, yeah. It's a chapter 4, 26. The kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground. He sleeps and rises night and day, and the seed sprouts and grows. He knows not how. So it is like you can, uh, when it's grow the seed, when, uh, when it's fed into the soil of the heart, which is cultivated mm -hmm. well, uh, we do, not, we do not know how they grow. Mm -hmm. But there is the tree, they growing, right? But as Jesus said, there was no fruit growing, but mm -hmm. tree looks beautiful outside. Mm -hmm. So Yeah. I mean, I think in that sense, those are just different parables, different things that... that I guess it's hard even with this one. Like, how related is that to the first parable? I would say it's actually probably not as related. Like, this is a, it's teaching a different concept. Um, where this is basically talking about God is the one that gives the growth. You can't force this. You can't make it happen uh, in any other way. Um, and so then the question is, like, what does it actually mean when the harvest comes? Is that just talking about salvation, or is that talking about judgment? Uh, and I think that's a, a different question, too. Um, but, yeah, the, the main point is that God gives the growth, and that this isn't something you can force. Uh, this isn't something that you can, that you can make happen. Uh, which, why would you be tempted to want to have that happen? If you look at verse 20, right, those that were sown on the good soil are the ones who hear the word and accept it and bear fruit 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold. You're hearing it, it's like, well, I want to, yeah, sign me up. I want to be 100-fold, please. And it's like, no, that's not how it works. Like, God is the one that gives the growth, and God is the one that collects the harvest, and it's to his glory and his timing and his purposes. All right, any other questions from chapter 4? Oh, yeah, and chapter 5. Uh, in chapter 5, verses 10 and 11, why do the demons desire to be in pigs instead of out of the country? Yeah, that's a great question. So, and I'm not actually entirely sure where I fall on this yet either. Um, some of it's just talking about that uh, spiritual beings have certain places where they're allowed to be. And so 
I think that is, that's fair. Like God has given certain spiritual beings certain areas where they're allowed to be. Um, and there is, I think, a place where demons can be cast into where they're not going to be released until time of judgment and time of and stuff in Revelation. And so these demons are saying, don't send us to that place. We don't want to go there yet. Like, we still have time. We can still do our evil things. We know you're going to win one day, but don't send us there yet. And Jesus is like, okay. And so he, he, sent, he, he permits them uh, to be sent into the pigs. Uh, Follow-up question. Yeah. They killed the pigs. Yeah, they did. Mm-hmm. So I guess that, when I wrote this type question, I, get, I guess that was just to cause more mayhem. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, the agents of Satan, they, want to dis- they seek to destroy anything that's good, so anything that's alive. So, that, that to do, so they did that just to create more mayhem. And mm-hmm. after that, it says the people asked Jesus to leave. Mm-hmm. Is that because of fear or they're hurting their... Well, definitely there's fear. Um, but I think what's interesting, if you look at that passage, uh, look at verse 15. Like when they get really afraid, it's when they see the demon-possessed guy normal. Um, so, yeah, so I'm, I'm sure there's people that were put out in one sense that they lost their, their pigs and that their pigs were in the water. Um, again, like Jesus didn't do that. The demons did that. Um, but their fear comes from seeing what Jesus has done to this man. Uh, and actually, really through the end of like 435 through 41 with the storm, uh, and all the way through 20, we have re- repetitions of fear. Um, that the, the disciples are afraid of the storm, and then they're more afraid of Jesus, right? There's, there's demons, right, who are afraid of Jesus, right? And, and then there's a, a, a fear of this, of the, what'd you say? Yeah, oh yeah, even later on, yeah, there's, there's fear, right? But th- this, this fear is a, is a response, is like good response in one sense, to seeing Jesus' power, right? Jesus' power over the storm, natural world, Jesus' power of the supernatural world. Yeah. Yeah, the fear of the Lord. Yeah, and, and, and he, I think he's deliberately setting this up. One other thing, real quick, and then we, I think we do have to get into the actual lesson, um, is that there is, there's three different repetitions, three different things that people beg Jesus of in that chapter uh, 5, like verses 1 through 20. Right? They, they beg, the demons beg him, right? Don't send us away. The people beg him to go away. And then the demon-possessed man who has true faith begs to stay with him. Uh, and so I, I think Mark is kind of putting it before everybody. He's saying, well, who are you? Are you begging to stay in your sin? Are you, are you begging Jesus just to leave you alone? Or are you asking to stay with Jesus? And that's what it means to be a follower. Is to, is, do you want to stay with Jesus? Do you want to be with Jesus or not? Um, yeah, so actually we are over what we should be in our time. Um, yeah, and, and just even with the end of that chapter, just the examples of faith, um, that, that, that sandwich, right, with the, the Jairus going to Jesus in faith, right, the woman going to Jesus in faith, right, the one who's bleeding, uh, all, the demonstration of faith and the way that Jesus interacts with them uh, is just um, pretty amazing. But Mark is trying to highlight, this is what faith looks like. Okay. If you have other questions, feel free to ask me after class. All right, Christianity Explained. So last week we looked at Jesus and his um, identity as the Son of God. Actually, I might have that on there. Uh, And so we looked at really his authority, his authority to teach, his authority to cast out demons, to proclaim the gospel, and this is stuff that we saw in those five chapters there. Um, Today, we're going to be looking at Jesus and what Jesus came to do. Um, and then what we see here is that Jesus didn't come just to show that he was the greatest healer, teacher, like most powerful, cool guy ever. Uh, he had another mission as well. And so Jesus' death and, and his resurrection, which we'll get to next week, are crucial. Really, it's the, it's the basic fundamental understanding of the gospel um, in our Christian faith. And so that's why when we're talking about Christianity Explained, and we need to know who Jesus is, we need to know what Jesus came to do and what he did do. Uh, So today we're going to be looking at his death on the cross. Okay, so the facts of the cross. 
And I, I have blanks on your sheet. If you miss a blank and you want to raise your hand and say, Kyle, you never said that, I probably didn't, so just let me know. Um, so the facts of the cross. So before we talk about Jesus on the cross, we just need to talk about the cross in general. Uh, the cross really is, is a symbol of Christianity. And so we can, I mean, probably go into any restaurant, walk down any street, any busy place in America, you'll find people with cross necklaces, you'll find people with cross tattoos, uh, you know, it'll be on their social media, you'll find crosses everywhere. You go to any graveyard, crosses everywhere. The cross is a symbol uh, of Christianity. And in some ways, we've co-opted a symbol from, from something that meant something way worse. Uh, the cross was a method of execution used by the Romans. And so there's really three things that they wanted uh, to, to do with the, the cross. It was a very deliberate execution. Uh, the first thing that they would want to do with the cross, the reason why they had it as a method of execution, was that it was a shameful, um, it was meant to shame. It was a shameful way to die. And so for those that were, going to be crucified, they would be whipped, they would be beaten, they'd be stripped naked, they would be placed in a prominent position where everyone could see them. So often at the, the gateways, the entries to cities, major crossroads, uh, they would be basically put up as an example of, of what not to do. Uh, and so uh, even their, their crimes would often be listed above them and why they were being crucified in such a way, why they would be killed in such a way. Uh, and the way that it would work, um, oh, and, and there's one other interesting aspect of this, uh, it, this method of execution was so shameful that Roman citizens weren't allowed to be crucified. They had to be executed some other way, uh, unless by direct order by the emperor himself. And so in such a, this was such a, a, a lowly way to die in their eyes. Um, and so the way that, that crucifixion would work um, is that every aspect of it was engineered to be the most brutal, the most agonizing, and ironically, the, the way to give you the most amount of life left, uh, to help you live longer. Um, and so what they would do is they'd whip you, um, they would make you carry your own cross beam, that was the, the beam that would then be put up on the kind of the upright uh, post or, or, or tree, they make you carry that to your own execution. And now, oftentimes, that was a, that was a mile or two walk to where you were going to be uh, put out. And so you were already going to be tired from that, carrying that. They nailed your hands or your wrists to that beam so that then you would hang by your own wrists uh, with, with nails basically going through, through the, the bones right there. Um, and then what they would do, and this is the, kind of the, the evil genius of the Romans, is that they would put a, a, either a block under where your feet were or nail your feet to the tree so that in order for you to breathe, you had to push off that block or push on your nailed feet in order to get breath into your lungs. Because hanging like this, you wouldn't actually be able to get enough air into your lungs. And so the way that they had this work was they basically made you suffer and die slowly over the course of days. Uh, and they prided themselves in how long they could keep people alive in this execution method. And so, it was meant to torture. That's your second blank there. And it was meant to kill. But you died not from bleeding out, but really from just slow exhaustion and asphyxi asphyxiation on that cross. And so, this is the, the method of execution that the Jews, the, the Pharisees, were able to, to, in cahoots with the Romans, get for Jesus. Um, and so the reason why the cross has become a symbol of Christianity is because of what happened when Jesus, right, the Son of God, went to that cross. And so it, it's more than just a symbol, it's more than just even a historic event that happened, and we like we believe it really had to happen, and it really did happen. Um, but there are spiritual realities that also happened at the cross. And so let's look at the, the meaning behind some of these uh, realities that happened at the cross. So turn to Mark chapter 15, if you're not already there. Um, 
Let's see. Could I have a volunteer to read uh, loudly verses 33 through 41? At the sixth hour, darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing near heard this, they said, Listen, he's calling Elijah. One man ran, filled a sponge with wine vinegar, put it on a stick, and offered it to Jesus to drink. Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to take him down, he said. With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion, who stood there in front of Jesus, heard his cry and saw how he died, he said, surely this man was a son of God. Some women were watching from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James the Younger, and of Jos Joseph and Salome. In Galilee, these women had followed him and cared for his needs. Many other women who had come up with him to Jerusalem were also there. All right. So this is the, the death of Jesus. Uh, and Mark, as he's been building this gospel, he, he's been building really even to, to these moments here to, to show what happened to Jesus. Um, and if we look right there in verse 33, we kind of have the first big, well, I mean, there's a lot of big things that are happening, but one of the, the main events of significance that happens there is in verse 33, uh, when there's darkness that spreads over the land. And this is from the the ninth hour, yeah, from the sixth hour to the ninth hour, which is roughly from about 12 to 3, so about three hours of darkness. Uh, how many of you uh, were able to see the eclipse that happened this, this spring? Some of you? Yeah. So I, I was actually, I traveled with some friends out to Ohio to, to get a good glimpse of it. Uh, it was really cool. It was really eerie, too. Uh, having broad daylight turn into basically dusk having birds and, and animals start making rackets, having everything basically seem upside down uh, for roughly 15 minutes, 10 minutes, however, what the peak of the, the eclipse was. Uh, what we know from history and from uh, even how when Jesus was crucified, we know that there was no eclipse then, um, as some scholars would like to say. Uh, for a, an eclipse to happen, right, I mean... Just draw it real, real, real quickly right here. For eclipse to happen, you have to have the sun right here. And then you have to have the moon in between, and then you have to have the earth. right? And so then there's a, a shadow right from the moon on the earth. That's how an eclipse happens. Well, when Jesus was crucified, and at the time of Passover, uh, the moon would have been on the other side. It was always after a full moon. And that's, that was the timing for, for Passover. So even just from like basic stuff, what we know of, of calendars and the, the events of the uh, Jewish faith, uh, even then, uh, the moon would have been on the other side of the earth. There would have been no uh, natural cause for this darkness. What am I trying to say? This darkness was a supernatural event. This was a supernatural event. It lasted three hours. Um, and in the language, even in this text, in the language in the Bible, when it talks about darkness like this, it, it's cosmic language. It's supernatural language. Uh, and specifically, it indicates God's impending sovereign judgment uh, poured out because of sin. And so in the prophets, when it talks about, um, it talks about the day of the Lord, it talks about judgment happening for sin, uh, darkness is, is often... Reference, right? It'll be, a, it'll be a day where the sun grows dark. It'll be broad daylight and, and darkness will happen. Uh, if you guys think back to the plagues in, in Exodus, in Egypt, darkness was one of the plagues. It was the ninth plague. And so darkness is, a, is an indication in this text here from Mark that judgment for sin, even final judgment for sin, is about to take place in broad daylight. And so Mark, he, he, he wants us to have this in mind that there is something bigger than just somebody dying on a cross. This is a supernatural event, and supernatural judgment is about to happen. We go to the, to the next event. 
so Jesus, right, he, he cries out. He actually says uh, these five words or four words in Aramaic. Mark, when, when he's trying to bring something really dramatic to the surface, really bring it to, to the fore, he switches back into Aramaic for the words of Jesus in the, in the Gospel of Mark. You guys saw that actually in chapter 5 when Jesus talks to the little girl and says, get up, right? He, he talks to her in Aramaic. Um, I think this is one of the little indications that Peter is the one telling all these events to, to Mark. You can almost just see Mark saying, like, well, Peter, what happened next? And then Peter's like, this is what he said. And he just kind of goes back into the Aramaic and just says it like that. Aramaic was the language that they spoke. Uh, it was the common tongue of that um, time for, for all of Israel, all the land of Israel. Um, even though Jesus also knew Hebrew, would have known Greek, that, was, that would have also been common. But very likely, right, he's speaking in Aramaic. And so these words are, are being recorded. They're, they're bringing to the fore um, something that Mark wants to tell us. And so what is the cry that Jesus has? In verse 34, what does he proclaim in English, not in Aramaic? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Yeah. Right. He's been silent since his trial before Pilate. He hasn't said a single thing. He hasn't said a single word. And so this loud cry would have been shocking. Uh, it, would, it, it would have been jarring, I think, to everyone who had been watching, who saw what was happening. Um, and it shows his intense emotion. And so he, he quotes Psalm 22, and he says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And Mark has actually referenced already this, this psalm three times in this crucifixion narrative. And it culminates with Jesus saying these words himself. And so what do these words mean? Why does Jesus say this? Well, first, it shows that Jesus is physically suffering under this spiritual weight that's come from God uh, for the judgment of sin. There is, there is a judgment that, that is there upon Jesus, and he is feeling it. He is suffering. He's, he's feeling the full weight of God's judgment. And so he cries out because of that. Notice he also says, my God. Right? He doesn't abandon God. Right? He says, you're my God. Um, so he still is, is remaining faithful to his calling, even though he's despairing. Um, but third, and this is what, what's really happening in this, in this moment, is that God, it, God in one sense, is, is turning his back upon his only beloved son, like we saw from chapter 1. Uh, and so, at least Jesus in his humanity is being abandoned by his father. Uh, and so... We'll get to why that is um, with an illustration. Yeah. Yes. Well, we're about to. I have an illustration actually. So to show this. So I got the most scary book, biggest scary book I could find, which is a Hebrew lexicon. Um, so if you want to be confused, just open this up. Uh, this is you. Right. This is you and your life. Right, this is you as a person, like my left hand, okay? Now, think about this book real quick. This book represents your life. Um, it's your story. It's, it's my story. And just think about all the pages that have your life story on them. Um, every time you've done something, it's recorded in here. Right? Not actually in here. I don't have that. But it's, it's, pretend it's recorded in here. Right? Every evil thought, every cruel action, every heartless deed, everything like that, it's all in here. And so I think we could all agree that there's probably some pretty dark pages about our lives that are in here. All right, well, this is you. This is me. And the ceiling, we're going to have to imagine, is God. Okay? Um, be careful. We don't want to get into heresies, but just for this class sake. Okay? The ceiling is God. This is the barrier between you and God. It's your record of your debt, of your lawbreaking, and it's the sin that separates you from God. Right? There, there's nothing that you can do to get rid of this. This is the barrier between you and God. And as we think about sin from a biblical perspective, 
Just one sin, just one line in this book separates you from God. Right? You don't need thousands and thousands of pages of your life to separate you from God. Only one sin, God says, is enough to, to separate you from God. Uh, and it's not that you've even just done one sin, but it's that who you are, that you're a sinner, that this is something that characterizes your nature. And if we think that's just from our perspective, think about God's perspective for, for a bit. Right? God is good, he's loving, and he's just, uh, and he does punish sin fully. And so he can't even look upon us, tolerate us, be with us in any sort of way. Right? So this barrier is, is immense from both sides, from God's side and from our side. And so this is where we get to Jesus hanging upon this cross. Because we have to say, what was the weight that was crushing Jesus upon the cross? Because, right, right hand, this is Jesus. Right? Jesus had no sin to separate him from God. He was perfect. He was holy. There is no barrier between him and God. But this is what happened upon that cross, is that he took that barrier and was separated from God. And he didn't just take the barrier of just one person or two people or a dozen. Right? He took all of the sin of all the believers from all time upon himself in those moments upon the cross, in those hours. That's what crushed him. That's when he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's what he was feeling. So even that, that feeling of guilt and, and separation that comes with just your own sin between you and God, right? when you were in your sin and you remember that feeling, right? imagine that a millionfold, right? a billionfold. That's what God, uh, that's, that's what Jesus was feeling upon that cross. Notice, when Jesus takes that sin upon himself, what happens to, to you and your barrier between God and you? Yeah, there's nothing. There's nothing. There's no barrier between you and God anymore once Jesus has taken that sin upon himself. And so this is what happens at the cross. If anyone wants to look at a Hebrew lexicon afterwards, they're welcome to. Um, this is what happens upon the cross is that Jesus, he, he substitutes himself right at the cross Jesus served as a substitute in the place of sinners, meaning that he took their sin and its punishment upon himself. We have um, 1 Peter 2.24. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness, that we can have that freedom, in one sense, to live righteously, to have no barrier between us and God. And his wounds, right, him taking on our sin, healed us of our wounds. And so when Christ became sin and died, taking that full eternal punishment, God executed his own son so that he could offer that free gift of salvation to anyone who would trust in what Jesus has done. And so this is, this is what has happened upon the cross. This is that substitutionary atonement. That's the, a big word there. But Jesus has basically gone and t- paid the penalty, taken your place, put himself as a substitute in for you, right? if you trust in him in faith, so that you can be free of that penalty. And so, as Jesus was dying, right, this is what was on his mind. And you look at verse 37. Um, it says, uh, and Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. And if we go through the chronology and we look at the other Gospels, that loud cry that he, that he proclaimed, that we can see from John, is he says, it is finished. As in, he lived his life, he was righteous, he was perfect in our place, and he took all of that upon himself, and he carried it all the way to the end, all the way to death. He finished. He did the task. And so, as he dies, right, he, he brings life. He brings access to God to those of us who never on our own could have had that access. Uh, which brings us to our next, next point. The curtain is torn. Mark uh, 15.38 And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. 
Now, what are we talking about? Why does Mark even bother saying this? Uh, the t- temple, right, if you could see over here real quick, uh, had multiple levels of access, if you would want to put it that way, to be able to be in the presence of God in his holiness and be able to perform sacrifices. Who are the people in the Old Testament that were allowed to, to go into the temple and even go into this kind of high access level? Yeah, the, the Levites, right? The people that were specially consecrated by God. Uh, and the priests, specifically the high priest, was the only one that could go into the temple, go through this first curtain, go through the curtain that basically was before the Holy of Holies, and go into where God's presence lived with his people. Now, this is the, the, the Holy of Holies in that sense. That was a very uh, privileged thing. It was only happening once a year that someone could go into that place in the Holy of Holies. Uh, and in such a way that any normal Israelite, right, if you were a Jew, like, you, you would never even think of going in there, let alone like, letting a Gentile into that area ever. When Jesus died, when he took that, that, that final death blow in one sense and said it is finished, that, cor- that curtain was just ripped in two, just entirely opened up. And all the, the, the Gospels make mention of this uh, because it's so important to see that access to God, access through that curtain, uh, is now um, made possible through the death of Jesus. And so for your, your first sen- uh, sentence there under the curtain, the tearing of the curtain, which is another supernatural event, affirms that access to God no longer comes through temple sacrifices, but through the one-time sacrifice that Jesus has completed. And so, Hebrews, right, this is a, a book that we've taught through in our Wednesday night class before, uh, in chapter 10, I think 19 and 20, talks about how through his own body, right, through the living body of Jesus, that was torn in two so that people could have access to God. Through that, th- through that uh, body, we now have access to God. And so, uh, we see this also happening uh, funny enough, at the beginning of Mark. So turn to Mark chapter 1 real quick. Keep your, chap- your finger there in chapter 15. Uh, but this is just a really a cool thing that, that Mark does deliberately in this gospel. Um, look at verse uh, 10. Look at verse 10 of Mark chapter 1. All right, we see the heavens are being what? Yes, torn open, split open. And then what is said in verse 11 about Jesus? Who, who is he identified as? Yeah, the beloved son of God, right? Go back to, to Mark chapter 15. Right, the curtain is torn open. Right, access to God is now available, not just to Jews, but to Gentiles also. And what does, probably like one of the most famous statements in the book of Mark, what does the Roman centurion who has been observing this crucifixion of Jesus, what does he say? Yeah. Like, access to God has been granted. Even the Romans, even those who are, are far off in one sense, they now can go directly to God through this man, Jesus Christ. And so Jesus' his death makes a way so that anyone from the Jewish beggar to the Roman centurion can have a relationship uh, with God. And it's only through this uh, Son of God that we can have this relationship. All right, so we've seen the, the supernatural darkness showing uh, the, the coming judgment for sin. We've seen Jesus' cry um, that shows that real weight and despair that he actually felt from the weight of all those sins. Uh, we see that, to- that torn curtain proclaiming that there is now access to God. Uh, and so the last... Um, meaning of the cross, we're actually going to go back to Mark 10.45 uh, real quick to, to close out today. Um, where we see what this cross actually accomplished. Can I have somebody read Mark 10.45? For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Okay. 
Jesus, right, he's teaching about himself and what he came to do uh, with his disciples. Uh, and he proclaims himself as the, the Son of Man. And so we don't have time to go into all the, the details in the Old Testament. But that was a, a very divinely powerful kingly title uh, that we see in, in, in Daniel. And so he's proclaiming himself as this powerful king, yet he's saying, and here's your blank there, he, he, he's saying that he's going to do this unexpected action uh, of the powerful king, the unexpected action of the powerful king, and that he is going to serve. Right? He is not going to demand service, at least not yet in that sense. But he has come to serve, and not just serve, but to lay down his life for people. And as we know this about just Scripture in general and about our own hearts, he's laying down his life, he's dying, not just for people that love him, for people that rebelled against him, for people that hate him. This is who Jesus has come to save. And no one expects a king to do this. And yet this, this single death, right, this one death, giving his life, what is it going to accomplish? What, I mean, you can just read the verse. What is it going to accomplish? It's going to be a ransom for many. Now, how many of you guys ransom stuff all the time? You know, like we don't do that, right? This is not a, a word that we use. Uh, another way to to think about this is, is the word redeem. Um, but it's really this idea of buying back, of, of, of buy, paying the price so that you now own it. It's now yours. And Jesus, that's what he's going to do uh, with those who have rebelled against him, who have, have turned from him. He is still coming to show mercy and grace and say, I'm coming to save you. Right? I'm, going to, I'm going to change your heart. I'm going to, to offer grace and mercy. I'm going to lay down my life and be crushed for you so that you can have life. I'm going to pay that price to buy you out of that kingdom of Satan, to buy you out of the world so that you can be mine. Uh, And so this is what we see there then for your next blanks there. The single redeeming death of Jesus brings new life to all who would trust in him. And this new life is characterized by who has bought it. Who has owned it? Uh, and, and we see in other places in the New Testament, right? You've been bought with a price. Right? You're a new people. You're a people for God's possession. You're going to be zealous for him and do good for him and do good works for him and serve him. Uh, and this isn't because Jesus is some powerful, awful dictator. No, it's because Jesus is a loving, compassionate king. And he shows this by, by dying for you, by loving you and dying for you so that you can live with him. You can have access to God. You can have a relationship with God, not just on earth, but for all eternity. Um, and so I think just uh, it's fitting to end there with the idea from Psalm 16, um, where we see that in the presence of this king, there is fullness of joy and at his right hand are pleasures forevermore. And that God, as he redeems his people and as he buys his people and brings them into a relationship with himself, it's not just a temporary thing, it's eternal. And it's for your good and for your, really, your, you get to enjoy God for all eternity. And as, as Mark highlights these things, as he talks about what Jesus is going to do in laying down his life and, and showing the sacrifice at the crucifixion, all of these, these ideas of the cross need to come kind of crashing into our minds. As we think about the gospel, we think about the cross. Uh, It's very easy for us to just say, oh, we have a necklace and I believe in the cross. Oh, yeah, that's what Christians believe. Um, But to really really dwell on those things uh, is really important. So I have three kind of thoughts there in your your summary there at the bottom. Three closing thoughts for you to think about for this week as you think about the gospel, as you talk to others, as as you pray, as you read scripture. Uh, first, the, the cross is intentional from before the foundations of the earth. Right, this has always been God's plan. This has always been plan A. And God's eternal plan for redemption has a cross at its center. Uh, so I think that's helpful for us to remember. Second, the cross is where God reveals himself in all his glory 
in this one act. All right, think about this. The, the creator of the universe grew the very tree that he would die on. He did that deliberately uh, because he can show you who he is in the crucifixion. He can show you his hatred of sin, his justice. He can show you his love for sinners and his mercy and grace. And he can show you that he, that he freely offers this as a gift. And all that is displayed at the cross. Uh, and then lastly, the cross is central to what it means to be a Christian. Uh, you can't claim the name of Christ and deny the cross. And so, as we, as we go on, as we live our Christian life, right, this is where we meet God, and this is where our Christian life begins. And so, let's be reminded of that uh, as well. Um, real quick, before we pray, your homework for this week. We have homework sheets. Rick has them. Sheets yeah. In summaries. Casting those out as you. Yep. Uh, so reading Mark 6 through 10, uh, just making observations and questions and all that. Um, and we're building up our, our Christian understanding of, of Jesus and of the gospel. Uh, we saw the Son of God. We're seeing the cross. Uh, we're seeing kind of the one last key leg of that stool next week. Uh, but let's pray. Lord, we thank you uh, for tonight. We thank you for the cross. Lord, help us just to be struck at what happened there at the cross and what it meant for you to take our sin. And Lord, I just pray for, for everyone in this room uh, that they would uh, be thinking about these things soberly, that there would be a, a joy uh, to know that there is forgiveness offered at the cross. Um, and Lord, I just pray for, for all the souls in this room that that would be true, uh, for all of them that they would have uh, turned to you in repentance and faith. Lord, I pray for those who are questioning or unsure or, or growing. Lord, I just pray that you would help them in those things, give them understanding, give them ears to hear and eyes to see. Uh, but help us to just worship you and glorify you through the, the, what you've done in sending your son to die for us. We pray all this in your name. Amen.